A very warm evening to esteemed members of the Circa Advisory Council, students, researchers, members of the academic community, ladies and gentlemen. As the year 2021 draws to a close, it's, it's time for reflection when we reflect on the year gone by and on our hopes for the year that lies ahead. I once again welcome you all to the Circa Expert Talk for December 2021. As always, we try to present national and international experts who share different perspectives on air pollution and climate change with you. This time too, we are pleased to invite Professor Jay Dhariwal, a young faculty in the Department of Design at IIT Delhi for the expert talk. The title of his talk today is A Breath of Fresh Air. Welcome, Dr. Jay. We spend most of our life in indoor spaces. In recent times, though, we are finding it hard to have access to something as basic as fresh air because of air pollution, COVID-19, climate change, indoor air quality, and thermal comfort-related trade-offs that are supposed to be made. For instance, open your windows. One may be concerned if there would be air pollution entering the indoor spaces along with fresh air. And if you don't open the windows, you may of having a high risk of COVID-19 in high occupancy areas apart from the thermal discomfort and poor indoor air quality. If you provide this air through HVAC systems for thermal comfort and better air quality, you may need to spend much more energy and money than otherwise. The strategies may also vary for different climate seasons and the levels of urbanization of the region. Professor Jay Dhariwal will share his perspectives on the learnings from the existing body of work in this regard results from some recent pilot studies and future research directions. I'm sure that this talk would be like a breath of fresh air for all of us in the literal sense. The talk would be for around 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a question answer session for 15 minutes. I now would like to invite Mr. Arun Dugal, founder of Circa, to share his thoughts and perspectives on the topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Hamant. Uh, th thank you for inviting me to speak, and I also thank Professor Jay Dhariwal for uh, uh, delivering this uh, excellent talk on a on a very topical subject. Uh, Circa, as most of you know, was established about three years ago as Center of Excellence for Clean Air and Climate Change, and has been hosting such talks as well as. Uh, undertaking several research projects and uh, other initiatives to uh, to provide more information to policymakers in terms of air quality and climate change i just looked up um, as to what is the air quality uh, in delhi today and uh, the aqi for delhi uh, that I could see was 285. So I said, where do we go to get a breadth of fresh air? The nearest place, ladies and gentlemen, we can go to is Shillong, where the <laughs> AQI today is 19. Most other places are quite bad. So there is a lot of work to be done and uh, all of us need to get engaged uh, in this effort to uh, make sure that measures are instituted uh, by the government to improve air quality all around. With that, I add my welcome to Professor Jay Dakwa uh, for their, his talk on a breath of fresh air and look forward to that. Um, yeah, thank you yeah, so Professor much. Sarnik, uh, yeah. uh, no, no, uh, I'd just like to invite Professor Sarnik Day to, uh, uh, to to introduce uh, Professor Jay Dhariwal. Sagnik? He's on mute. Sagnik, you are on mute. I think uh, uh, I think he's on mute. So let me take this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Professor Jay Dhariwal to the participants. 
Uh, Professor Jay Dhariwal is an assistant professor of the Department of Design at IIT Delhi. He's an humanist of IIT Guwahati, uh, Purdue University, uh, US, and IIT Bombay. He did a couple of postdocs from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA, and the University of Leeds in UK. His uh, research interests are in the area of design for health and wellness in the built environment with a present focus on air quality and adaptive thermal comfort. Over to you, Professor Jay. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Dukkal, uh, uh, Hemanji, Shagnik Day, and all of you who could join. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, as you can see from my virtual background, I really love uh, being with nature. Um, so the talk is about, I mean, let me probably first uh, share my screen and then uh, I can probably talk about uh, the work. One sec. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible to you all? Yes, please. Yeah, and uh, as you can also see, uh, uh, you know the uh, the picture that I've, I've shared on the uh, on the bottom right uh, is is about nature, and it's uh, like uh, Mr. Dougal said, uh, another place uh, maybe like Shillong. Uh, it's uh, it's Oli, where in, you know it's known for uh, winter skiing, but it transforms into a, a beautiful alpine meadows. Uh, during summer monsoon time, I, I happen to be here for a monsoon trek and um, and I sincerely hope, you know, one day in Delhi also uh, we have air quality like that. Um, so I actually I was wondering uh, when I was asked uh, or, you know, uh, that, you know, what should I be talking about today? Uh, you know, we had such an impressive lineup of speakers in the monthly expert talk series. Uh, there have been talks conducted. Uh, you know, fr from a long time from Circa when we have learned a lot, uh, but also the monthly expert talk series, uh, if I can go back to uh, when Professor Vikram Singh talked about, he shared his interesting insights into uh, air pollution and climate change nexus. Then Professor Mayank Kumar, he talked about the chemical speciation of sources of air pollution, uh, followed by Professor Shagnik Day, who talked about the process of coming up with WHO air quality guidelines, which are also applicable indoors and why we should be concerned. And then there was a panel discussion with Mr. Duggal, Dr. Chintan Vaishnav, Dr. David Hagen. We talked about the innovations needed in such a space. Um, so uh, I thought, I mean, I, I, I wanted to take some cues from the previous speakers and hopefully add some value today. So uh, during the Circa panel discussion on innovations in air pollution stage, space. It was mentioned by uh, Mr. Hisham about the importance of hyper local air pollution monitoring. So I'll probably uh, want to talk a little bit about that and also take a cue from uh, Professor Vikram Singh's um, talk on the uh, nexus uh, between climate change and air pollution. So um, I'll take a cue from that also in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so apart from talking about the usual suspects like uh, the particulate matter, uh, you know, I would also want to discuss with you guys about a gas which you normally talk in the context of climate change, but how uh, it can also cause a poor indoor air quality all over the world and can also be a proxy for COVID-19 virus transmission again all over the world. So hope you guessed it. Yes, uh, uh, carbon dioxide is what we'll also talk about. And so the talk today, uh, I wanted to keep it along the lines of more of like citizen science. That is, you know, so that, you know, more of us could get engaged with this timely topic and whatever experiments that we'll discuss today, we'll also show that e how even a high school kid, you know, could create that experimental setup and participate in fighting this battle together. So hope uh, you guys are all prepared and uh, let's get started. So uh, as uh, Hemanji had, uh, you know, uh, pointed out about, uh, you know, uh, the abstract of this talk about you know how air pollution, climate change, indoor air quality, COVID-19, and and thermal comfort, they could be related, and uh, so so that's why maybe we are always wanting to make choices what is good for us or not. You know, uh, this is as you can see uh, the view of, from a classroom, and uh, uh, like many other uh, reputed organizations, institutes, 
you know everybody is wanting to open up while minimizing the risk of uh, uh, covid 19 in indoor spaces so what are the strategies that we should use so that's what goes into the minds and uh, you know and and when we talk of indoor spaces so indoor spaces i mean we spend most of our life in indoor spaces so it's like residential spaces offices hospitals and not just that even cars or trains and so on you know so so uh, when you talk of COVID-19, uh, right? So it has been suggested that to have the spaces uh, naturally ventilated to let the fresh air in. To get fresh air in, you may want to uh, open the windows. But when you talk of Delhi, you know, you may wonder that, you know, uh, the air pollution is high. So should you open the windows or not? So, uh, and if you open them uh, or if you don't open them and you want to provide that fresh air to HVC systems, then the, the energy uh, impact would be huge. And uh, so, and, and that is winter time, right? And in summertime, uh, high occupancy means a higher heat generation. And uh, so, would you, could you open the windows? You know, the air pollution may, may not be as high as winters as far as Delhi is concerned. So, so these are all the uh, concerns that we have and uh, for Delhi and, when, and what if the climate is different? What if it is Mumbai or Chennai when it gets very warm and humid? So more ventilation may be needed. If it's Rajasthan, Western Rajasthan, it's a hot and dry climate. So maybe you may want some evaporative cooling, I mean, to, to help cool. So what if it's a rural area and not an urban area? So how would the strategies change? So that's what probably we need to, uh, you know, think about. So uh, the way the talk is structured is, uh, we'll first talk about, you know, these terms, those different terms that are thrown at you. Uh, what do they specifically mean? And uh, once we have a good understanding, we will want to review some existing body of work um, done in this area. And then we'll share some interesting insights from pilot studies and some experiments that we did talk about and followed by some future uh, research directions. So let's understand these firms, terms first. Uh, many of you would, would know these, but just very quickly, right? Let's, uh, uh, you know, revise some of these th things. So air pollution, as you know, I mean, like uh, we, we talk when we say air pollution, although uh, it's both outdoor air quality and it's also related to indoor air quality. But uh, typically it's uh, talked about in terms of, uh, you know, the outdoor air pollution, which uh, one of the most important things is particulate matter that we talk about. But then there are other gaseous pollutants also uh, that are important to be considered like NOx, uh, uh, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and others. Uh, climate change, uh, as Professor Vikram Singh in his earlier talk uh, had, had talked at length, and we already have a sense, uh, we'll talk, uh, so uh, he did mention that most of it has to be because of, uh, you know, the energy use uh, uh, that we have, a very high energy use that leads to it. Uh, indoor air quality, when we talk of it, uh, sometimes we may think that, you know, uh, it's, in terms of burning of solid fuels, you know, uh, in, you know, for cooking, which has been used indoors, um, uh, uh, you know, and, but because of LPG penetration, maybe that has got better. Uh, we also get concerned with indoor air quality uh, because of maybe tobacco smoke, and we should be concerned. Uh, but then there are other things which, which are also important, but which are less talked about. Um, uh, I mean, like, for, for instance, uh, the particulate matter and the gaseous pollutants, you know, entering indoors. Uh, so that is something we need to talk about. But something like CO2 also, you know, we exhale out 100 times more CO2 as compared to the, uh, you know, the CO2 that we breathe in. And if we don't get enough fresh air in the space, then what can happen is there could be a buildup of CO2, which could have some health related impacts, which we'll talk about. Then there are volatile, volatile organic compounds, which are off-gassed uh, by, you know, building materials, paints, and a lot of other equipment that we have in offices like photocopiers, printers, and, and so on. And, and of course, uh, because of the biological contaminants like the viruses, uh, uh, molds, and, you know, these things also contribute to a poor indoor air quality. Uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, needs no introduction, but uh, what I would like you, you to guys, guys to think about is uh, think of carbon dioxide as a proxy for COVID-19 risk, uh, and that's why it becomes important. Thermal comfort, again, uh, the whole of uh, Northern India is going through a 
a, a cold wave and so uh, i need not tell you you know uh, what thermal comfort may be uh, but it, it is called as a condition of mind and i think that is important if it's too hot or too cold or if it is just okay how do you feel and it is a uh, a topic of uh, you know uh, weather or comfort and you know this is a, 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 a that's how maybe some small talks get started uh, on the dinner table so as we understand these terms then let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of the other things like uh, if you want to talk about reducing virus transmission indoors then uh, it is talked about that you know you should make your indoors as outdoors um, so that's that's what some of the advice uh, that comes to us is and you know it talks about uh, opening windows if you have hvac center systems then you know uh, maybe introducing hepa filters everyone wearing well fitting masks and you know reducing that length of time that you are in the room so if you are there in the room for a greater time then it may lead to a greater risk of covid and that may be because of us breathing each other's air uh, let me also briefly introduce uh, what do we mean by thermal comfort so when we talk of thermal comfort then there are all these processes as you can see uh, my cursor let me yeah. yeah all these processes are going on depending on whether a person is indoors or outdoors that is a person is uh, uh, you know may get sun uh, affected by sun if it's winters it's a good thing if it's summer then maybe not such a good thing uh, he may be perspiring uh, his his comfort may also be related to his metabolic activity that is whether he is sitting sleeping walking or doing some exercise and likewise uh, you know there may be uh, skin diffusion and conduction and the clothing may also play a role so all these things may become important now one may wonder that why are we talking about thermal comfort uh, you know when we are talking about air quality but uh, we'll discuss as you will realize that they are related uh, they are related in the sense that you know just to give you a quick hint that say it is very cold right uh, and then you may not want to open your windows because it's cold but that may also mean that you don't get enough fresh air in right so because of your thermal comfort considerations you don't open your windows and then don't let the fresh air in and there is a co2 build up which may not be as good for you so that's how it may be related now just to give you some stats about thermal comfort so for india buildings uh, consume about 30% of uh, the energy as far as uh, as far as international energy agency stats are concerned and cooling and you know make maybe uh, having a 10% of total uh, energy use and little bit for heating also but the cooling share is also expected to grow considerably uh, there is a india model for adaptive comfort that has been developed by sept university that has been uh, probably added in the national building code uh, that we do have and adaptive thermal comfort like i said uh, may lead to a less covid-19 risk there are other things also to be concerned if you're talking about the uh, the indoors the buildings indoor environmental quality is what it's called then it's like visual comfort that is lighting daylighting views they may also be important and acoustic comfort and there is a, a publication from us uh, uh, when i was doing my postdoc at mit uh, we talked about it in detail so you 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 can go through that publication um now just to uh, give you a sense of uh, you know how do you compute this thermal comfort there are so many parameters that are there like the air temperature is one uh, then you know there there could be an effect of solar radiation there could be humidity there could be wind then we could be wearing certain kind of clothing and then there could be some activity we, we might be doing so how do you put all of this together uh, into an index uh, which is called a thermal comfort index and there are many thermal comfort indices uh, <clears throat> I, what you see on the screen is a utci universal thermal climate index uh, that is mostly used outdoors uh, but it's it's more about the adaptive nature of comfort and since we'll talk more about the naturally ventilated buildings so this some people have used it indoors as well now as you can also see here um, that it has a range you know if you are within this range 10 to about uh, say about 26 degrees celsius you may not feel much thermal stress and within this there is actually 18 to 26 degrees which is a thermal comfort zone and as the feels like temperature increases you may feel hotter if it 
decreases, you may feel cooler. And this is based on a, a 340 node uh, model of the body developed by Fiala. And there is a simplified model uh, on this link. And so uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll try to just uh, try going through this link quickly to, to just give you a sense of what do we mean. Um, so uh, let me click this link. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Uh, and probably you cannot see my that screen, so I'll, I'll share this uh, in the form of uh, just one sec. So I'll uh, I'll share another of my screens. Uh, <coughs> hope my screen is visible now. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, I wanted to give you an example of say, uh, what would you feel like as a temperature when you are standing under the sun? Say the temperature is, uh, you know, say 20, 20 degrees Celsius, as it may be now. Uh, if you are under the sun, then the mean radiant temperature that you feel that may be about 15 to 20 degrees higher. Uh, we can talk about it later of uh, why that is the case. And then say humidity right now, I don't know if it's 80. Right, and the wind speed, although it is at 10 meters, let's assume that you know it's it's minimal, it's not there. And so, so the temperature that you would feel, although the air temperature is 20 degrees, but you will feel as 27.5 degrees Celsius. Right, you will feel a bit warmer, which is a good thing. Now, what if uh, you know it's very high humidity during monsoons? Say the temperature is 35. So you may think you know the temperature is the 35, but then and say you're not standing under the sun. So it's like the mean rain temperature uh, is uh, is similar as uh, the ambient temperature, but the humidity may be very high, right? And that's why you feel so stuffy. And so just imagine what the UTC or the thermal comfort index or the feels like temperature that we're talking about could be. It may be over 50 degrees Celsius. So that's why it, it becomes important that all these factors, they work together. And so we need to look at them. Last example that I'll take is uh, say if it's cooler, say it's just in the in the evening, say if it's seven degrees Celsius, there's no sun, humidity again right now it's it's higher, and but the wind speed, the wind chill is very high, say 10 meter per second. Then although the temperature is seven degrees, but because of the wind chill, you will feel like it as if it is minus 13. So that's why I think it, it becomes important that we use an index to capture the effect of all these uh, weather parameters that are there. So I'll now go back to my previous screen. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, hope you can again uh, see my screen. So the last thing I will talk about is uh, passive solar architecture, and then we can probably get started with some body of work. And so passive solar architecture, it becomes important because what it means basically is that you design your buildings uh, as per the sun, you know, the way sun moves into the sky. And whenever you would want to move to a new building, you know, some of us may want to know that, you know, go and, you know, you may want to check the building that where the sun is, you know, during the afternoon, whether what kind of rooms get what kind of sunlight and which don't. So, uh, you know, what you see here on your screen is, the example of New Delhi, this is a building in New Delhi. This is the north side that is on your uh, left side. And uh, what you see is the sun. So if it, this is north, um, if this is north, then this is east, right? This is west. So the sun rises from here. It goes overhead and then it sets in the west. That's, that much we all know. But what you should also know is that what this represents is basically the summer solstice. That is during summer solstice, the sun will actually be on the south side about five degrees from the vertical. And when it's winter solstice, which is uh, which we just had uh, about a week ago, then the sun will be lower into the sky and this will be about uh, 20, so uh, 28 degrees is roughly the latitude of Delhi and then the declination angle uh, is 23 degrees, which is what the earth tilt is and so it's about uh, 50 degrees from the vertical so so that means about 40 degrees from the horizontal so that's where the sun is maximum and so and so if there is no building that is shading your building then you will receive a lot of uh, sunlight in 
and during equinoxes uh, it should be 90 degree minus the latitude of a place and that's how the sun path always is so which means that if you are at the tropic of cancer or above then the sun would always be on the southern side if you are in the northern hemisphere right so so i think these things play a role and why this becomes important because this affects uh, thermal comfort for sure and then some people also talk about you know the disinfecting properties of sun and in some cultures you know we do talk about uh, you know uh, worshiping the sun getting up in the morning and you know uh, you know giving uh, arc to the sun i mean and, as some of us do and so there are some building simulation tools that are available that can estimate uh, comfort lighting levels energy consumption in building and so all these things are taken care of and so if you want to know more about it there was a publication uh, from us uh, some time back about this and uh, <clears throat> so again i mean if we revisit the classroom after this understanding then uh, you know we have a better sense of how uh, the outdoor air pollution or climate change or the indoor air quality in terms of co2 levels voc uh, covid-19 thermal comfort how could these things be related and we will uh, you know what strategies uh, we should use is something that comes to our mind so let's review some existing body of work uh, quickly and uh, <clears throat> so i think the the first thing that uh, we do want to talk about is uh, not such a usual suspect which is a very high uh, co2 level uh, which we normally like i said talk in the context of climate change but uh, a very recent uh, publication uh, you know in nature sustainability in 2019 they did talk about how high co2 levels uh may lead to potential health effects uh and as you can see as concentrations at concentrations which are you know lower than 5000 ppm uh, you know between 1000 to 5000 or 2000 as you can see less than 4 hour exposure uh you know could lead to uh, uh health outcomes some cognitive effects inflammation has been found uh bone demineralization kidney calcification and so on and as you will realize that these ppm's concentration of co2 levels that we are talking about they can uh, you know we we all may be subjected to and i'll i'll show you through some experiments on on myself that you know how we can easily go beyond these concentrations and so why this becomes so important and so in this publication they talk about two things uh, i mean like many things but a uh, few things that are of interest are one is the indoor co2 levels that get breached in you know while sleeping uh, in offices uh, where you know you don't get too much fresh air and and that may be rightly so you know when people may talk of climate change they may want to reduce the energy consumption so the fresh air amount may be maybe 5% maybe 10% so this may uh, become much higher right but they are also talking in terms of the rising co2 levels outdoors which were at around 2 280 2 Uh, you know 2 270 ppm and then now they've risen to about 400 ppm and as per some estimates uh, it is said that by the end of this century they may even rise to 1000 ppm outdoors if it is outdoors then you know uh, there is no way that we could reduce go below that uh, that level and so this becomes like uh, very very important in in the context of human health so it's not just important to have low co2 levels for the planet's health but also for the the human health and so this bedroom thing you know that you know in bedrooms they can exceed 2500 ppm easily when the doors are closed for privacy or the windows are closed for energy conservation and the building ventilation is reduced so uh, i would want to take this as an experiment that whether, whether it's a myth to be busted or is it really a fact so we'll 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 very quickly uh, talk about this uh why co2 levels have become more important in recent times after covid earlier maybe it was not too much of a concern maybe uh, <clears throat> and in terms of indoor air quality because we were not talking about it so much but uh, with covid actually it has become so much more important so here this graph that you see so when we breathe out when we exhale out carbon dioxide so much carbon dioxide with that you know we also exhale out uh, you know aerosols which may be uh, containing uh, you know the, the sars cov2 virus so as you can see this is like an infect safe there is a person indoors who has uh, who is exhaling co2 but along with this co2 he is also exhaling sars cov i mean maybe exhaling the sars cov2 virus with the aerosols 
so what may happen is so this is like the co2 all over in the room and some of it you know may be captured by the air filter some of it may go outdoors but if there is a susceptible person or many susceptible people then what may happen is there is a potential that you know they may capture this uh, aerosol having sars cov2 virus and get infected so there have been many uh, publications about the airborne transmission pathway of covid and so it has uh, uh, you know become even more important to consider co2 because the more the number of people which means the more we are breathing each other's air earlier it wasn't so much of an issue but now you know there is a potential that we may have uh, you know we may be more susceptible to, to the covid virus and that's why you may uh, you know hear about these guidelines of you know uh, with uh, the omicron virus uh, concerns you know the the occupancy in, the, in some of the indoor spaces has been reduced to 50% or less so like it was mentioned earlier you know make indoors as outdoors and you will be safer uh, from a covid point of view uh, and then there is also uh, something called a sick building syndrome which is like uh, the way the building is built can it make you sick there are so many studies there uh, all over the world which talk about you know so many uh, health related effects that could be there uh, because of sick building syndrome and indoor air quality poor indoor air quality may be one of the most common causes of that and uh, as you can see poor indoor air quality we also know that it can cause respiratory discomfort we can feel very stuffy uh, it can cause improper recirculation of odor and can decrease decrease our productivity creativity and we did talk about the pathogen levels as well so um, let's talk about uh, the climatic zones of the country of how you know the buildings have been uh, you know constructed as far as the vernacular architecture is concerned or even using building science and i would like to refer to you a, a book uh, or a handbook actually from professor uh, jayant k nayak and architect jitain prajapati uh, the handbook of energy conscious buildings um, so i think uh, we can learn a lot from that uh, to 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 work on climate responsive architecture and i was fortunate uh, to have uh, learned a lot of building physics concepts from professor nayak and professor nayak did his phd from iit delhi long time ago and now has retired as a faculty from department of energy science and engineering iit bombay um, but uh, yeah i would recommend you to to have a look um, <clears throat> so in terms of uh, the map of the country as you can see you know there are uh, five climatic zones as we can see a uh, hot and dry climate then there is a coastal climate then there is a few areas of uh, temperate climate bangalore pune and such areas uh, colder climate around kashmir and then there is composite climate which is like if it ha it has a mix of different climate uh, climatic conditions like so delhi falls in a composite uh, climate region and so there are certain strategies that have been mentioned that you know what can be done so that our our, our we, we need minimum Uh, energy and we can have our uh, spaces to be naturally ventilated and uh, i mean it it could help us out uh, for instance in the winter time you may want to resist heat loss and so uh, you know you may want to decrease exposed area if it's monsoon time then you know you may want to have much higher ventilation and if it's monsoon you want to decrease humidity so on and so forth um so uh, the the uh, the nbc the national building code that we have uh that mentions about the minimum ventilation rates that are needed in 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 the breathing zones although there are no separate indoor air quality guidelines that we see and as you can see it is on a per person and area basis uh for different kinds of facilities that are there and what has been mentioned about co2 levels is just about that the over 1000 ppm more than 1000 ppm is not desirable and so i will be a little bit faster now just in the interest of time but uh, we can uh, look at some of these things uh, later as well so these are some of the existing uh, indoor air quality standards worldwide and as you can see they do who and other countries they do talk about the carbon monoxide levels or co2 levels or temperature relative humidity voc levels and so on so for who recommends less than 1000 ppm and then australia china they also have uh, some guidelines and then there are other countries also which have guidelines but mostly it is about 1000 ppm or below uh, that is uh, recommended but are these standards directly applicable for india or not is something that we need to see so there are certain research gaps that we do see in the ventilation guidelines 
that is uh, we do have uh, you know we don't have specific indoor air quality guidelines as a part of our separately and in national uh, building code there's some that are mentioned although more is desired but that is more from energy uh, 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 you know conservation point of view or indoor uh, environmental quality point of view but we also need to look at the mix of what is the impact of outdoor air pollution or infection control which is uh, covid-19 and we need to look at them for from different climates point of view and then ventilation modes also may play a role More, many of the buildings in india are naturally ventilated but there are also air conditioned and mixed mode that is a mix of these buildings and depending on the different buildings or indoor space typologies what you see is a, a covid hospital uh, uh, you know space and an office space so that may be different <laughs> So now let's talk uh, quickly about the insights from the pilot studies and then future uh, research directions. So as I told you that you know uh, uh, you know the low cost sensors is what was mentioned by in during one of the talks, and so this you see a very common uh, microcontroller that is used that is uh, you know easily uh, used by even a high school kid, uh, thanks to many uh, Atal Tinkering Labs which are there all over India, and uh, and. even if it is not for them but the diy electronics has become so common that any of you could just uh, use the circuit and thanks to one of our uh, uh, project scientists prasanna who's put it together on this link so you could just make these connections uh, with the sensor just four connections needed and as you can see uh, i i had made this connections but in the interest of time i'll uh, i'll not do that i had i had a matchstick and if i if i used a matchstick and you know blow it then what you would see is that these are the pm concentrations uh, without you know burning the match stick which was still if you look at the pm 2.5 level it was around 140 which is not uh, and this is like an indoor space where i'm sitting it's not uh, very great uh, but when i when i burned that match stick you know uh, so this level that actually uh, you know went when this we did just half an hour ago Uh, and so it reached 1400 uh, microgram per meter cube easily and this is the interface uh, and then you know you can you can use it to do that um so what we did is uh, we also did a bunch of experiments um uh, actually and uh, so so before i talk about low cost sensors i also want to tell you that why is there a need of low cost sensors because uh, the air quality monitoring station as one of them you can see in the photo here uh they can they can be very costly you know they can easily cost upwards of 1 crore uh and there are about 40 of them all over delhi uh, but there are uh, places in india which don't even have a single one of them and so uh you know uh, so what do we do uh, you know in such a case um uh, and so thanks to uh, i think uh, 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 you know professor shadnik dey and his group they've also developed uh, uh, satellite data which could provide a very good spatial resolution of 1 uh, square kilometer and um, but but what if i want to uh, get even lower than that or if i want to have a lower temporal resolution what if i want to know as a person what is the air quality where i am sitting and then whether it is a good time to go out for a jog or not or whether if there is greenery around then will the air quality be better versus if it's more concretized a space so um, i think that's why uh, we wanted to do these experiments and uh, thanks to professor uh, uh, ravi kunchla professor shagnik de sarka for providing us this access and also uh, professor sheshan shirang rajan who who and our group uh, gulshan the phd student prasanna we've been working together on this and so the very first experiments we did here as you can see our sensors being here and this is where the 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 AQ, aqms bam the beta attenuation manet monitor which is a reference method is so this is like we wanted to capture the diwali peak and as you can see uh, bam is the reference method and then these are the sensors of one type that we use so it is able to capture the trend very well although this is we we we've, we've correlated this for a week and that is just uh, on the raw data if you process this data if you use algorithms if you use Uh, other parameters like temperature humidity maybe it can get better but already the correlation is quite high i mean it's about 70% and the root mean squared error which is uh, it's it's just about 50 microgram per meter cube uh, difference is there uh, likewise we also did it with another sensor type and we found the correlation was even better although in the raw data the you know the 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 sensor was 
giving much higher values. It was able to capture the trends and the Diwali peak, but then again, it's it's, it's the R square. So so the way the uh, you know the the mass this PM value is reported is assuming a certain density for uh, the those low cost sensors versus a BAM. So if we just uh, fix that, if we calibrate it, then you know maybe it will be much closer. So, but we are very happy with our initial results and we'll, we'll move forward for this. And as I've already told you that, you know, you all also could do these experiments wherever you are in your cities. You would have uh, an AQ AQMS in different parts of India. And so you could just take your local sensor there and get a sense of it. Next thing that I did want to talk to you about was local sensors for CO2 monitoring. Again, uh, we have put the entire code and everything here. And like I said, any high school kid could also do this. I had this set up again in front of me again within with, with this Arduino and all and I exhaled air on it just to get a sense and um, and I think uh, before we move on very quickly I mean I don't know if can you, anyone can guess what the CO2 levels in a closed car with four people sitting for about 45 minutes would reach to and when I'm talking about a car it's just an economy car like a Tata Indica or an I-10 or you know something like that. So just uh, think about it and, and you will you will know. I don't know. You may be right, but many of the people who I've talked to they said maybe 2000 ppm, 3000 ppm, but let's see what 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 it would be. Uh, so before that, I think this is what the that sensor was as I blowed, uh, you know, exhaled air on it. It, it you know, it was showing CO2 levels much higher. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is a very interesting graph uh, that is, uh, like I said, it, it tells you a lot of things. So we wanted to as a first experiment understand the CO2 buildup with occupancy in a closed car. So what it tells you is uh, let's let's understand it bit by bit. So the Y axis is the CO2 PPM. The X axis is <clears throat> the time. We did this experiment on 17th of December in Jodhpur um, from about 419 PM to 524 for about an hour. And so first I think this smiley that you see is like one occupant then you know another two occupants uh, were there. So the, the very first I was the occupant then there were like more of my family members who joined and as you can see when I was sitting I was sitting for some time and so already the CO2 had built up to about 2000 ppm and then it started building up again and then there were like two more people who joined after about uh, 15 minutes and then the CO2 build up was happening and uh, you know it, it went to be much higher. Um, and the initial time we kept for calibration of these low cost sensors. These were some of them were from Testo and some of them were from Aerogram, which is a, a, a star IIT Delhi startup and courtesy of uh, Professor Sheshan Srinagarajan for lending these sensors for experiments to us. And so we want to do the calibration and calibration wise the, the R squared value was very good 98 99% for these low cost sensors. And then we opened the door because one of the people had to leave another one joined in, in 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 his place and so there was a co2 level came down and then again it started going up and so until here all the sensors were kept together after this point since we had calibrated them well we kept them at different locations so these low cost sensors were, were in four seats and in between was a reference co2 uh, monitor called testo and so this is like you see a person who's like holding one of these sensors and likewise there were like four people and as you can see Thus, wherever the person was sitting, uh, so because he's also exhaling his breath, so the CO2 levels easily breached, you know, about 10,000 ppm. And in between, I think here, the Testo uh, CO2 ppm was about 7,000 ppm or, or a little bit more than that, about yeah, 7,500 ppm. So as you can see, you know, within an hour or actually less than an hour, the CO2 levels can go so high. So what do we learn from this? So first of all, CO2 levels can build up to unhealthy levels in less than an hour with just four people sitting in a very, you know, harmless space, you know, doing people doing harmless activities. The CO2 levels higher are higher close to people exhaling CO2. So again, we could also get a sense of, uh, you know, how the CO2 levels spread, although more experiments are needed. This is just one such experiment. But uh, you should also think, have you been any such situations in classes, office, trains, other spaces? Uh, although the CO2 and air is invisible, so you know you may feel stuffy after a while, but then you may not notice some of you. So likewise, we did another experiment, like I told you about uh, the CO2 levels in a bedroom, and so again, this was an interesting experiment. And uh, <clears throat> so what you see, there is a lot going on here. So this is where I live, and this is the bedroom, 
and uh, you know this is where i am sleeping and there are like three sensors one is inside the blanket one is right outside the blanket in the bedroom one is in the lobby outside right and this is like about a 20 feet by 20 feet space uh, you know in the press apartment and so what you will see is we started this experiment on 25th december and the location was new delhi iit delhi campus and so we started this experiment around 10 pm and then we went on till about 9 pm and as you can see uh, you know you know many of us if it's it's cold and we were not using any heater as as you can see so you would want to put your face into the blanket you know just because it is so cold just so that you can feel very cozy so what you can see is there are two effects happening here so one is that you know when you put your face in the blanket that causes co2 spikes because you know again uh, unlike the car which has a higher volume so you just being there in your own blanket the volume is much lesser so in no time you know the co2 levels can can reach 10000 ppm and as you can see and, and the rest of it i was sleeping and so it's like in between you know taking the face out putting the face back in and as you can see wherever the face was in so you can see some spikes of co2 uh, but the room co2 ppm as you can see there were two occupants uh, me and my wife and so it reached by the morning time about 3500 ppm so actually what the paper in nature sustainability talked about that was not a myth it's a fact and this is when the door was opened and that's when it led to the mixing of the co2 levels between indoors as well as outdoors which stayed at 800 ppm earlier but then then it increased so there's so much that you learned but let me talk about another uh, okay so very quickly i think the insights we have covered all of them uh, but let me also talk about the thermal comfort angle to it why do we put want to put our face into the blanket and does blanket really keep us warm so if you look at the utci levels right which is if you remember i told you about the thermal comfort or the temperature equivalent that we feel because of the air temperature humidity and other factors so uh, as you can see uh, the the room utci that actually stayed constant at about 16 degrees uh, and also th that that was the same for uh, the you know the 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 sensor in the lobby as well but if you look at in in the blanket utci level so that actually increased quite a bit you know so it even reached 34 degrees uh, you know to to the extent of us somebody feeling hotter you know in, inside the blanket although this doesn't lo look like a continuous graph because this utc uh, calculation is very complex so i just did this calculation at an half an hour interval just for us to get get a sense but using a scripting you know you can get more continuous curve so there is so much that we could learn just from these experiments and like we said we could all do these experiments using some of these sensors on, on an arduino or some basic microcontroller and then learn so much about uh, our indoor air quality so now quickly about the future research directions so again i i would ask you i mean are we better prepared now now that we have looked at some experiments and also looked at uh, you know how all these things are related um but some quick recommendations and then probably i'll wrap up in in 5 minutes <coughs> is that you know higher co2 levels outdoors as well as indoors are a cause of concern not just for the planet but for our own health and we are not alone in this it's not like oh, in india things are worse from outdoor air pollution point of view yes there is a lot that we need to do but then the whole world is facing a lot of these issues not just for climate change but also one, one must consider many of these colder climates that we see in northern europe northern united states there they have extremes of weather so many of the buildings are weatherized so to keep a, a better indoor air quality in terms of low co2 levels it's not it's not that easy so you know i think there is a lot that we need to do on on that side also i think uh, uh, you know they need to become more adaptive i mean i was just quickly doing a back of the envelope cal calculations for how much does uh, energy do we need for heating and cooling for india versus say united states so if you look at it at on a per capita basis you know uh, united states could be an order of magnitude higher you know so i think uh, there is a lot that uh, you know all countries need to work on and as we can see i mean the famous quote by uh, mahatma gandhi attributed to mahatma gandhi is that you know earth can provide enough to satisfy every man's needs but not every man's greed so we need to as any sustainability scientist would tell you we need to stay in sync, sync with nature uh, reduce energy use simpler lifestyles adaptive thermal comfort fresh air we need to practice climate responsive passive solar architecture so that our buildings are aligned with nature so that we have lesser needs for our comfort and energy 
and i mean my sense is we should india should stick to more of naturally ventilated buildings and not move too much towards the air conditioned buildings with adaptive thermal comfort and even if energy is needed it should be low energy cooling and there needs to be more emphasis on air quality and health impact research not just related to air pollution but also indoor air quality in terms of co2 levels and these are some of the future research directions for our group in terms of working more on the low cost air pollution sensors so i did tell you that you know anybody could get started but you know where it gets tricky when you use low cost sensors is that you know whether they'll work in all climates what happens if the humidity gets higher so we want to do some uh, you know we've, we've got some climate chambers and aerosol generators and you want to simulate many climates and then see if they work well and then create a wireless sensor network of these and then you know calculate the indoor to outdoor pm ratio for different building typologies and climates we also want to understand co2 levels spatial temporally indoor spaces uh, i just talked about one few experiments that we did we also have done some experiments in offices or observed uh, what happens in uh, a second ac third ac or sleeper coach in a train but that is more of like an observational uh, study but much more needs to be done we also want to understand bioaerosol do bioaerosol sampling for airborne transmission of covid also understand this adaptive thermal comfort and uh, indoor air quality nexus and lastly i think uh, i mean for the country i mean we feel we we should work more on the ventilation guidelines for environmental health perspective and uh, you know how does outdoor air pollution affect uh, the indoor spaces how do we update the guidelines considering infection control and we need to look at all these things together i mean outdoor air pollution infection control climate change indoor air quality and all uh, for better environmental health and wellness so with that uh, thanks a lot and uh, i think uh, i mean that's all i had to share uh, thank you so much to all of you for giving me this opportunity and also for all the contributors who were there for this work i mean i'm just sharing the work but there are many more people who have been involved right from the teachers to faculty to students and all that so so thanks again thank you jay for a very uh, enriching talk we have uh, but many questions but i think we have about two questions so far so let's quickly uh, get to the questions the first is what is the order of expense associated with co2 sensor would like to have one at home in office this is posed sure. by tanmay yes so hi tanmay um, the the sensor that uh, we bought uh, i mean like uh, this doesn't cost more than about uh, you know uh, 3000 rupees Uh, and that was when we when we actually calibrated it for some time with a uh, with a reference grade uh, monitor you know the the r squared the correlation was about 98% so uh, i mean i would always suggest that we do calibrate them but then 3000 rupees for a sensor and then if you have an arduino board it's again 500 rupees maybe so 4000 rupees per sensor that is again like i said for you to get started if you want to see the display of it just add a lcd display another 500 rupees so maybe in 5000 rupees you can get started but then what we do is we go beyond that we add a data logger to it we also make a pcb version of it to make it uh, cheaper more robust and reliable and uh, so that way you know we can do much uh, much more measurements so but for 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 anybody to get uh, started like we said this is about citizen science and there's so much to be done so i think we've got to work on this together and so it will be great if uh, many of you could just take this up and then you know just report your own findings of uh, what do you find uh, i i hope that answers your question uh the last question we have is what are the imperatives for older buildings in view of the new ventilation guidelines issued by the government uh, in view of covid uh, okay um, so uh, you talking about older buildings is that what you're saying yeah, because uh, the older buildings the older buildings with the older designs okay okay so what you're saying is uh, the buildings that already exist right yeah 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 so the buildings that already exist and and covid is a recent thing so i think all of us are uh, you know uh, i mean i i guess struggling to know that what do we work with i can just tell you what my sense is again there is so much more that needs to be done and we've just got started um what would we suggest i mean like i think uh, uh you know try to get in as much fresh air as possible although the abstract did say you know that may lead to a little more air pollution inside but then you know it's not like if you close your windows you're going to be totally safe right because you said you from a covid perspective so my sense is 
keep the building as naturally ventilated as possible. Open your windows. That's what the COVID guidelines as I understand are. Um, and also uh, try to be a little bit more adaptive. You know, like when we talked of thermal comfort, if you remember the definition I gave, it's a state of mind, right? So I think if you can think that, you know, you are, you will be willing to accept a little bit cooler or hotter weather then you know you will be okay to uh, you know accept a little more fresh air right and so okay. if you do that then covid wise i think it will be the best possible thing although um, i mean there are more things related to say can we do some force ventilation that is can we have an an exhaust if it doesn't exist then you know install an exhaust which exhausts uh, you know uh, air uh, you know complete i mean so so in terms of air changes per hour, I mean, there are guidelines uh, from in the National Building Code and from the government also about 12 air changes per hour are recommended in facilities like healthcare facilities and all. So that all helps. But then, uh, I mean, in, in layman terms, you know, you can introduce an exhaust. And the best thing is, you know, buy this CO2 sensor if you can, just put it there and then try out different things and you will realize whichever leads to lower CO2 levels is great. So just to add to your question, you know, we did a, brief experiment in my office, although more needs to be done. We said, what if we open the doors? What if we open the window, not doors, door, uh, because there's just one door in my office where I'm talking from, or I have an exhaust, fortunately. Uh, what if I, we put the exhaust or we were about seven people sitting in a small space, about three meters by three meters, uh, you know, length uh, by width. And we could see that if, if we don't open the door, window or exhaust, and if we don't wear the mask, when we are all sitting together, then the CO2 levels can get much higher. You know, within 10, 15 minutes can go to like 1500, 1600 PPM. But if you are using these strategies, then the CO2 levels can stay around, you know, 500, 600 PPM. But I would say do your own experiments because one experiment doesn't tell you much. In fact, just to add one more thing to what you asked, uh, I was going, uh, I mean, my hometown to Jodhpur, I mean, so I was going by train. So I thought, why not just do an observational study? Although for a, um, a much more detailed study is required and you need permission of the authorities and all but just uh, I, I kept a, a, a test or reference grade monitor in the second ac uh, and uh, you know and then i moved around in the third ac and also in the sleeper and this was just around i think 11 december 18 december which is like you know the colder time frame and the co2 ppms they were not that high it was full occupancy the train was fully occupied and I think they're about, I mean, how, do, how, how many in second AC, they're about 50 people in third AC, they're about 72 people and sleeper about again, about 80 people or so. And so the CO2 PPMs were about, I would say about 1300 PPM on an average, uh, although they did, did get higher. And that was just one sensor that I'd kept. We need to keep many more. Third AC, they were reaching about 1600 PPM. And when I was sitting for just about half an hour, having a chit chat with some other people, and in the sleeper though, I mean, in the sleeper coach, it was about 800, 900 PPM. So the sleeper, it was, you know, the best, but in terms of thermal comfort, obviously, um, in the second AC and third AC, it was about 23 degrees UTCI or thermal comfort, but in the sleeper, it was like much lesser, maybe around 15, 16 degrees. So, so, you know, I'm not sure is second AC, third AC better thinking about COVID or sleeper. So the, the jury's out and this is just one experiment. So I, I hope that, uh, uh, addresses part of your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jay, we have a couple of more questions that we can quickly take it in two, three minutes because we are already sure. uh, out of time. So in sure. your experiment in bedroom, did you also have humidity sensors for UTCI calculations? Yes, yes. So uh, the the sensors that I had uh, from, uh, from this test, so they can measure the CO2 levels, they can measure the temperature, they can also measure, measure the relative humidity. So all those things, the same sensor could measure and we could have uh, measured more parameters. In fact, the, the PM values also we measured uh, with a near reference grade uh, instrument, uh, a, a grim monitor and, uh, and, and these low cost uh, PM sensors also. But uh, I think I need more time for a more authoritative study. But again, the PM levels were, you know, in the range of about 150 to 200 or I mean, like similar to outdoors. And when it rained after that, they did come down. So yeah, I think so. That is what I can one, tell you. One another question. What is the effect of oil heaters that we use in winter season in a closed room? Yeah, so in fact, uh, I did uh, put in a, a, a this uh, oil heater also. Uh, although again, in, in the interest of time, I didn't share 
although we did uh, put in a oil heater uh, for about two hours. So what I could see is that the the temperature, uh, the ambient temperature that increased from I think 15 degrees to 17 degrees is what I noticed. I've not looked at the entire data, but then just because it radiates heat. So the mean radiant temperature probably around where it's kept maybe a little bit higher as I to give you an example of the sun. But I think one interesting point, the important point to consider is if you'll use an oil heater uh, in terms of its radiative properties, maybe it's great. But if you want to keep the ambient and temperature of the room to be you know, warmer, then you would what you one may do is one may just want to close the doors, close the room so that it becomes more thermally comfortable, right? But then if you do that, then you know the CO2 levels will also increase. So that's a trade off you have to make. Same thing in summer, you know, summer, you know, you many people use split air conditioners, split air conditioners don't exchange, don't give you any fresh air. So you'll get very, very, I mean, you'll feel very thermally comfortable, even cooler. But then what happens to the CO2 levels is something that, uh, you know, we don't normally uh, think about. Thank you, Jay. We come to the last question from your presentation. It is very evident that development of built infrastructure highly influences what we breathe. Number of stakeholders have roles to play, and uh, uh, right from policymakers, planners, builders, architects, and engineering. What challenges do you see currently from the viewpoint of uh, uh, built infrastructure development? That is, can we have a liberty to build structures wide apart so that adequate sunlight reaches? Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So, so first of all, I mean, there are, I, I think up two, three questions rolled in one as it, as I can see it. Um, so the first thing I would say that, uh, as you can see, when you're talking about buildings here, uh, you know, uh, there are so many people that have to be involved and much more than before, you know, it's not just the building scientists, architects, planners, or, or MEP people who work on the MEP, uh, you know, it's also about now, uh, aerosol scientists or uh, virologists, you know, so all of us have, or, you know, those who work on the, the electronics part of it, the sensors part of it, and maybe many more, I'm, I'm missing out uh, st the structural engineers, you know, so, so many more people. So first of all, it has to be a very interdisciplinary approach right from the very beginning, number one. Uh, the, the good news, I think, for India, uh, as I understand, is uh, some of the stats that I have looked at is that, you know, a lot of the buildings that have to exist about uh, 15, 20 years from now have not yet been built. So there is a, we have a clean slate and there is a lot that could be done if we look at many of these things early enough. Um, now talking about the, the sunlight, right? Um, so yes, there are a lot of building simulation tools that are available, which can tell you, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, how much uh, gap do you need to put within the buildings so that, you know, the adequate sunlight can reach but uh, so so that is all that could be there in place, and we have these guidelines uh, like Griha and Leeds and other ratings are there, and also um, so th this is not too difficult to do. I mean that that could be done. ECBC Energy Conservation and Building Code for commercial buildings is there, so all these guidelines are available. Um, but what I would say is, uh, at this, on one hand, it is important, but on the other hand, some people, you know, if if you are building doesn't have windows facing on the south side. You know, you may get some sunlight from the east side or from the west side whenever the sun rises or sets, right? So what do you do in that case? So uh, for, for the buildings that have don't have sunlight, which have windows on the northern side, for them, the good thing is the, their building will stay cooler. Um, but to get sunlight, if you, if you really want to get sunlight from, from, I think, health point of view, you need to go out and get, and get that sun, you know, how much ever you can. In fact, I'll just share one more thing. Um, when I was at MIT uh, for my postdoc in the Department of Architecture there, there was one PhD student, her work was actually about uh, New York City. And she was talking about in her PhD was that how, uh, uh, how much daylight a certain space receives. It could, it could be a skyscraper. You know, it is directly correlated to its real estate value. So, so, you know, uh, it can become like, uh, you know, even more expensive as soon as people start understanding that, you know, how, how important it has become now. So I don't know if it, uh, if it helps answer the question. 
thank you, Professor Jay, uh, for a wonderful session. I will not be able to take any more questions because of positive kind of time. So uh, it was a wonderful session which you shared and your, your perspectives on the topic. Uh, I'm very sure every participant would have enjoyed your talk and there would be plenty of takeaways uh, from this lecture. I also want to thank everyone for participating in today's talk. And finally, before we close, I want to wish all of you a very happy, healthy, and a prosperous new year from Sarkar. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Happy new year to all. Thank you so much. Thank you.